to our webinar on an in-depth look at the streamlined filing compliance procedures. This uh, webinar is being presented by Esquire Group. Uh, this presentation is prepared for educational purposes only. Uh, it is not legal or tax advice, nor should it can be, nor should it can be uh, construed as such. Each individual's circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. I'm your presenter today. My name is Jimmy Sexton. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, my education. I have a bachelor's in business administration with an emphasis in finance, a JD, an LLM in international taxation. Uh, I'm also the president of Esquire Group, which is an international tax advisory firm with offices in Austria, Germany, the United Arab Emirates, and the USA. We specialize in international taxation, including tax issues facing U.S. citizens and resident aliens living abroad, expatriation, investing or doing business abroad, and foreign investment uh, in the United States. Fluent English and German. If you want to know a little bit more about me, uh, you can click on this link and uh, read my entire profile. So before we dive into what the streamlined procedures are, briefly going to talk about you know who U.S. tax laws uh, pertain to. The people that we're going to be talking about that could use uh, or take advantage of the streamlined filing procedures are going to be U.S. taxpayers. And U.S. taxpayers are basically U.S. citizens, U.S. permanent residents who are uh, you know, green card holders, or those meeting the substantial presence test. And the substantial presence test is basically where you can become a U.S. resident um, just by spending too much time in the U.S. So this would be somebody who's a foreigner, is not a U.S. citizen, uh, is not a green card holder, and just spends too much time in, in the United States. And the way uh, the substantial presence test is calculated is if, for example, we wanted to figure out if somebody met the substantial presence test for 2017, uh, we would add up all the days that that person spent in the United States uh, in 2017. And if that person spent more than 31 days in the U.S. in 2017, then we'd add uh, a third of the days that that person spent in the U.S. in 2016 and a sixth of the days from 2015. Uh, and then we would add those numbers together. And if it equaled 183 or more, then that person uh, would meet the substantial presence test, would be considered a U.S. resident for uh, income tax purposes, and it would basically be subject to the same tax filing requirements as uh, a U.S. citizen or green card holder. If you're a U.S. resident, uh, meaning a citizen, uh, a green card holder, or meeting the substantial presence test, then you have to file a U.S. income tax return to report your worldwide income. Uh, so basically income earned from anywhere in the world. Uh, you're also liable uh, to file uh, a report of foreign bank and financial accounts, uh, also known as the FBAR. This is uh, essentially uh, an information return uh, if you have foreign accounts uh, with uh, that are have ten thousand or more dollars in them, then you have to file this report uh, to disclose those those accounts. Failure to do so results in uh, some pretty substantial penalties. Uh, also, it is uh, the U.S. has uh, several international information returns that need to be filed to report ownership or certain transactions with various types of foreign entities. Uh, so for example, you'd have to file a Form 8938 to report foreign financial assets, uh, Form 5471 to report foreign corporations, Form 8865 to report foreign partnerships, Form 8858 to uh, report uh, foreign disregarded entities, Form 3520 and or 3528 to report foreign trusts, uh, Form 8621 to report passive foreign investment companies, which are basically foreign mutual funds. Uh, and then there's some other miscellaneous international information returns that can be required as well. So failure to do any of these things, especially as it relates to foreign income or assets, can carry with them some fairly substantial penalties. Uh, and not everybody is in full compliance. Uh, some people willfully tried to 
you know, not file these forms and not pay the tax. Others didn't comply because they simply didn't know or misunderstood. And so uh, we're going to talk about one of the ways to get back into compliance today, which is uh, the streamlined uh, filing procedures. And um, we're going to go ahead and dive into those right now. So the streamlined filing procedures, we're first going to talk a little bit about what the general eligibility requirements are uh, to take part in the uh, streamlined filing procedures, because there are two different streamlined filing procedures, one for uh, U.S. taxpayers that reside in the U.S. and one for U.S. taxpayers that reside outside of the U.S. And we're going to talk about both but these general eligibility requirements apply to both streamlined uh, procedure. So first, as I mentioned, uh, these these uh, filing the streamlined filing procedures are available to individual and or the uh, estates of individual taxpayers residing outside the United States and U.S. individual or estate taxpayers residing inside the United States. And depending on whether you reside inside or outside the U.S., uh, will determine which uh, filing procedure uh, to use. Uh, you must also certify that the conduct was not willful. So basically that your failure to comply with your U.S. tax obligations as it relates to foreign income and assets was not willful. So what, what does not willful mean? Willful means that you either didn't know about the filing requirements or, or other tax obligations. You had a misunderstanding of the law. For example, you hired an attorney or an accountant that gave you bad advice. There can also be, in the event of some extenuating circumstances, where you know you may have failed to notify your, your accountant because you didn't know of the foreign income or assets. You know, we've had situations, for example, where a parent had set up basically a savings account for their child uh, when the child was very, very young. And then when that child was an, was, was an adult, moved to the United States, became subject to, to U.S. Uh, tax laws and had no idea that they had this account until later. And then when they became aware of it, they had to get in, into compliance. But the non the non willful the, the non willful aspect is very very important because there has to be a statement of facts explaining why the conduct was non willful that's included in a certification that is filed with the streamlined procedure under penalty of perjury explaining why the the failure to comply was non willful and in looking at whether or not something was non willful the IRS is going to look at several different factors. So they're going to look at when you found out about your U.S. filing obligations, how long it took from the time you found out to the time you took action. Did you ever have reason to know that you might have U.S. tax filing obligations? So for example, with uh, FATCA, which is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, Foreign banks now have to request W-9s from their U.S. clients, and they oftentimes have to have other forms signed by their U.S. client. And the IRS can take the position that, let's say, you didn't know about your tax obligations relating to foreign income and assets. The IRS can take the position that when you receive this W-9 from your foreign bank saying that... And, and other fact documentation basically saying that they have to report your account to the United States, that at that point, it should have triggered a thought in your mind that maybe there's some tax obligations here and I should look into it. They're also going to look at your level of education. They can look at your experience in business, dealing with finances in your household. And so it takes a lot of analysis uh, to, to look through a person's circumstances to determine if in fact they qualify as, as non-willful. Uh, also cannot be under civil examination or criminal investigation by the IRS to take part in the streamlined filing procedures. So now we're gonna move on, we're gonna talk about the streamlined foreign offshore procedure. Uh, the streamlined foreign offshore procedure is for US taxpayers that are resident outside of the United States. So in order to be eligible for this particular streamlined procedure, 
the taxpayer must first meet a non-residency requirement. The non-residency requirement is basically they cannot have a U.S. abode or they have to have been physically outside of the U.S. for 330 days in one of the most recent three tax years for which the tax return due date has passed. So, for example, 2017, we have now passed the tax return due date of April 15th. So if somebody was going to take part in uh, a streamlined procedure, we would look at 2015, 16, and 17 to see if, if that person was outside of the United States for one of those three years. So assuming they meet the non-residency requirement, then we have to look and see if they failed to report gross income from a foreign financial asset and pay tax as required by law. So a foreign financial asset is basically a you know, bank account, a brokerage account, uh, an annuity, a foreign mutual fund, something like that. So there has to be unreported income from, from that type of an asset, and, and you have to have failed to pay taxes as required, and, and you may have failed to file an FBAR. So if you meet these requirements, if you meet these eligibility requirements, then you could take part in the streamlined foreign offshore procedure. And what that entails is if you have not filed tax returns or FBARs, uh, you'd have to file or amend up to three years tax returns. Uh, and when we talk about the three years tax returns, it's the three most recent tax years for which the due date has passed and file or amend up to six years of FBARs. So obviously, if you haven't filed tax returns or FBARs for this period, then you would be filing tax returns for three years and FBARs for six years. Uh, if you did file returns and or FBARs, uh, then you would be uh, amending those returns and or FBARs for, for the same period, the last three years or the last six years. Uh, you have to pay any back taxes and interest. However, if you'll, you'll notice my last point down here, there is no penalty associated with the streamlined foreign offshore procedure. Uh, and then you also have to sign the certification, uh, which contains your statement of facts that the conduct was non-willful. And, and again, that is signed under, under penalty of perjury. If you don't meet the non-residency requirement to take part in the streamlined foreign offshore procedure, there is also a streamlined domestic offshore procedure that is available. And to be eligible for this, you have to not meet the non-residency requirement of the streamlined foreign offshore procedure. You have to have filed your tax returns for the most uh, recent three years for which the due date has passed if you were required to file a tax return. If you weren't re required to file a tax return, then, then this eligibility requirement uh, is waived. But if you were required to file one, then it must have been filed. And you may have filed, failed to file an FBAR. If, if that is the case, the requirements are, are very, very similar. You have to file up to three years amended tax returns or file original tax returns in the event that you didn't have a filing requirement. And you have to file or amend up to six years of FBARs. You have to pay any back taxes and interest. Again, sign the certification of non-willfulness under penalty of perjury. The disadvantage of the streamlined domestic offshore procedure as opposed to the streamlined foreign offshore procedure is that the streamlined domestic offshore procedure does carry with it a 5% penalty based on the highest value of the unreported assets. So basically what we do is we look at the uh, you know, six-year FBAR period and the three-year tax return period, determine in which year the unreported assets had the highest value and then the penalty is 5% of, of that highest value. So those are uh, essentially the two streamlined filing procedures that are available for U.S. taxpayers who non-willfully failed to comply with their U.S. tax obligations as it relates to foreign income and or assets. And there's a couple of noteworthy items here that I, I thought uh, were worth pointing out. So the first one is you're still eligible for the streamlined procedure even if you previously filed what's known as a quiet disclosure. Quiet disclosures is not really a, a, an actual IRS disclosure. The quiet disclosure is, is the terminology used 
when a taxpayer simply tried to uh, amend their returns to fix their compliance issues without taking part in an official uh, IRS amnesty program, such as these streamlined procedures. And the IRS has taken the position that, you know, people who have taken part in, in these quiet disclosures uh, should be looked at very carefully and scrutinized because to just let people amend their returns to get back in compliance without any consequences is unfair to the people that have spent the time and money to go through one of the IRS amnesty programs. So the IRS has, has said that uh, if you've already done one of these quiet disclosures, you can still take advantage of the streamline procedure. However, if the IRS assessed any penalties uh, prior to you taking part in the streamlined procedure, then you're still going to be liable for those. So if you've done a, a quiet disclosure in the past and the IRS hasn't uh, assessed any penalties or audited those quiet disclosure returns, then you might want to take a look at uh, going through a, a streamlined procedure now to protect yourself uh, from the IRS scrutinizing uh, those quiet disclosure returns. You do need a valid taxpayer identification number to take part in the streamlined procedure. So that's either going to be a social security number or an ITIN, which is an individual taxpayer identification number. This is actually quite a big problem for what, what are known as the accidental Americans. Uh, there's a lot of people residing abroad that were born abroad to U.S. parents or where one parent was an American and the other wasn't, and they're born with, with dual citizenship. But because they grow up and live in, in, this, in, in the foreign country without knowing of the U.S. tax obligations, they never applied for a Social Security number. Uh, so those people then have to go out and obtain a Social Security number to, to, in order to get back into compliance. Uh, this next point, streamlined procedure or offshore voluntary disclosure program. So the offshore voluntary disclosure program, the actual requirements of, of the, the OVDP is outside the scope of, of this presentation. But the OVDP is uh, a much more cumbersome and expensive IRS amnesty program to get back into compliance for not reporting foreign income and or assets. A lot of people try to squeeze in to the streamlined filing procedure to take advantage of no or, a lo or the low 5% penalty as opposed to the OBDP penalty of 27.5% or 50%. Now, the advantage with the OVDP is the actions don't have to have been non-willful. In the OVDP, you're basically going to the IRS and saying, hey, I you know, intentionally didn't comply with my U.S. tax obligations or you know, I buried my head in the sand even though I knew I was supposed to do something, but I wasn't sure exactly what. Then you can take part in the OVDP because the actions could have been willful, which is also why there is a higher penalty. My advice is if your actions were willful, take part in the OBDP as opposed to the streamlined procedure. The IRS is really scrutinizing the statement, statements of fact of, of taxpayers taking part in the streamlined procedure. And if they find any reason to believe that the taxpayer, taxpayer knew or should have known, uh, then they can challenge the non-willfulness. So the OBDP uh, in those cases offers a lot more protection. One of the downsides of the streamlined procedure uh, is there is no IRS acknowledgement of acceptance. Uh, you basically file your streamlined procedure and no news is good news, which makes some taxpayers rightfully so uh, a little bit uneasy. The returns submitted under a streamlined procedure are subject to audit, so uh, the IRS uh, can audit those returns. Also, the returns can be checked against information received from banks, financial advisors, and other sources. So, for example, the, they could check the returns against information that they received from foreign banks pursuant to FATCA to make sure that you properly reported everything. And if you didn't, uh, then they could audit those returns and assess penalties and so forth. And then lastly, something I've mentioned before, which is uh, the certification uh, that contains the statement of facts uh, outlining the non-willfulness of your conduct uh, can be reviewed by the IRS. And in our, in our experience, 
uh, in recent times, the IRS is, is reviewing those very carefully. And so it is very important that statement of fact be very detailed, uh, not only point out the reasons that it was non-willful, but also to point out and address any issues which could work against your non-willfulness so as uh, not, not to hide anything. That is uh, our webinar today on the streamlined procedures.